Hello again, and welcome to the next episode of Outcomes. I'm your host, Barrett King, and with me today is someone different. I think you're going to like this conversation. This is Carl. He's the SVP of Worldwide Partners and Alliances over at Zscaler, has a real storied career in channel and worldwide in that particular statement, very uh, wide breadth of experience across a variety of different uh, regions and markets. And so super interesting combo to have today. Uh, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thank you, Barrett. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, I'm excited. I, this is going to be a different kind of convo. I've tried really hard over the last couple episodes to diversify my guests and have something a little bit, you know, kind of spicy, a little bit new. Our combo today really focusing on the idea of feedback, the idea of listening to those that are in the channel that are doing the work on the front line right. and actioning on it. And we'll get into that in a second. But first off, let me ask you, what does partnerships mean to you? Yeah, partnerships to me is really a mutual commitment and it's really a really trust. So I think a lot of times people try to force a partnership or to accelerate the speed of a partnership. And the reality is if you don't have a foundation of trust there, it's really hard to have a, a really strong partnership. But when you like do that. have that trust, so much can be done. And that's where greatness occurs. So that's yeah. my big line that I always think about. Where does trust come from, actually? that's I don't usually get into that level of, um, yeah. everyone talks about trust, right? Partnerships is about trust. I get that. Where does it come from? How do you develop that? You, you, you know, it's the old adage, it's earned, it's not given. So I think there are, it takes some level of longevity. So I've been in this business for 30 years of that the last 15 have been in the channel side. And, you know, having relationships and, you know, being straightforward and responsive, I think is really how you build that trust. So probably 50% of my conversations of escalations are, are not good, right? It's, a, it's some contentious problem that's going on in the environment. And I can't always deliver race and sunshine. It's sometimes more difficult news. But if you're consistent in how you go about it, if you're honest and straightforward, and if you're trying to get a win-win outcome, that's how you earn that trust over the years. And over the years, now people know they can call me and they're going to get a straight answer. I'm going to always have their intent and my company's intent in mind and try to drive a successful outcome. The consistency piece is interesting. You're talking about obviously having a variety of conversations, some good, some bad. How do you develop consistency across? Well, I should maybe be more specific. Are the partners that different that consistency is really tailored to each individual or is it because you've got perhaps a more universal partner set, you can uh, create consistency in the way that you engage the entire ecosystem? Yeah, I think consistency is driven by listening um, and being fair and sharing the outcomes and you know, having, a, you know, again, over time, every time you have a, a good engagement or an engagement and they come back, there's trust there. So now some of the people that I've had 20 year relationships with, we know right away, whatever answer I give them, I've done everything I could do. If it's a brand new relationship, I may need to go into a little more detail saying, let me give you a little back channel. Here's the work that I did to kind of drive this conclusion. Here's the results that I found. And here's why the rationale, you know, I always, it's the old adage, you know, anyone would put aside or some parents you say, you know, because I said so as an answer, mm -hmm. well, why can't they do this? Because I said so. That's not a good answer, right? So I always kind of think, well, what is, what is the why behind the decision that I'm making and delivering that to them, kind of the rationale behind it. And this always leads to good to success. Yeah, that transparency is important. I, I've experienced that in my own career. If we double down on the idea of how you build that feedback opportunity, how are you actually then, you've got a, a plethora of, of experience and background across certainly mm -hmm. years to your point, but also a variety of different companies. What's been the, the maybe the, guiding light or the, the standard idea methodology that you used around how you elicit feedback and how you really consistently listen, as you've described it, to what the frontline teams and partners and, and really the channel overall is experiencing. Yeah. It's all about listening and being curious. I mean, I probably reverse the order. It's about being curious about people's roles, people's perceptions, people's desires, what their needs are, and then asking questions and truly listening with an open heart and open mind. So just because you have a belief system that something may be the right way to go about it doesn't mean it is. There's different ways to look at it. So, you know, in my current role or my current position, I spend more time speaking to our field sales about how the channel is doing than the channel team. Because sometimes speaking to the channel team is if I want positive affirmations or I want to hear good news, I can speak to the channel team. If I want sure. to hear the reality of the state of the business, I speak to the sales team, what their needs are. And I always feel like it's, you know, those, those conversations where you get a sales leader or the closer you are to the customer, giving you really candid dialogue on what their needs are, that's gold. Those conversations are gold. So even now, every two weeks, I'll have a skip level review with two or three regional vice presidents in the field from around the globe and have an open forum. 
And I'll start it off by saying, are there any hot topics for you? And if there's not, I'll just start picking up some topics, which I know are a little contentious purposefully. Sure. So I want to get their feedback. And then I can, you know, any move that I make, and I always say that, you know, if I'm building a program or building an initiative, all I have is the honor of pull, collaborating some great, pulling together some great ideas and then delivering it back to them. I'm not sitting here thinking of these fantastic ideas on how to go to market. I'm just here collecting a lot of data, consolidating it, bringing the best ideas out to market. So it's a great position that I'm in right now. Well, and it's selfless to your point. I mean, you're talking about consolidating and then uh, synthesizing in many ways the feedback you're getting across a very large group of people and then mm -hmm. using that to action against the best outcome for the customer, the partner, everyone else throughout that, that life cycle. You talked about the skip level component of it too. Are you then documenting? I'm thinking about the listener here going, okay, cool. How do I action that? Are you documenting it and looking for trends? Are you taking each of those conversations and actioning in a specific region? How are you yeah. really at, you know, um, um, doing something with that, that information? There, it, that's a phenomenal question. And, and I'll say why, because with the first couple calls, I wasn't documenting it. And I, besides in my own notes. So in that case, sure. who collected the information? It was all in here. I wasn't sharing. I wasn't growing my leaders. I wasn't sharing the information. Now what happened is I have a, um, a great partner in operations who will come and listen to the call and she documents notes. What I'll oh, do is I'll take the names out of who I was interviewing, working with to kind of protect the innocent because I want them to be completely transparent with me, good, bad, ugly. And then I share those notes with my entire leadership team. And I just like, it's 15 minute read, spend the time because your, your business is mentioned. So different aspects of different rights to market, different areas where we're going. So spend the time listening and reading this and digesting what's there. That would be great. So a lot of it's collaborative then. So you're, you're taking these conversations, you're getting the feedback, you're, it sounds like using a team member who's done an exceptional job of synthesizing it and, and putting it back out. How do you then go and take that by region? Well, actually I should say, is it by region? Is it by geo? Is it by team? How are you then compartmentalizing it and actioning yeah. it specifically, right? Versus the global methodology you're describing. So I do it by region. So I'll okay. be regional vice presidents in a theater. And then I also seg segment it by sales segment. So sometimes there'll be the group folks that call in majors, Global 2000. Sometimes there'll be more folks that call on the commercial market because yep. their needs and their alignment to the partner community is wildly different. Sometimes it'll be folks that they're really interested. I know they have a passion around uh, managed services. Okay, we're going to pull those in and have that conversation. So I try to segment it as much as possible because I want to be having dialogue that's important to them and their business because that's when they really open up. It's not about, this is not about me at all. This is about their business and making them more successful. And when you take that kind of servant leadership view on things, sure. man, folks really open up. Yeah. So as you become this vessel and now you're facilitating the sharing of information, the ideas, the methodology that you've described in terms of the global approach, how do you then go and engage the partner community too? Because what I'm picturing is you're talking about action sure. and very specific feedback to the business. How do you translate that to the all-in-one, the better together, all the stuff that we talk about in partnerships? Yeah, well, well, I think the... Where the interlock is, Vera, I think a lot of people in my role, we do listen to partners. We meet with partners. We ask them questions. We're curious. But that's sometimes where it stops. Where we're getting a one-sided view. Yep. Where you really do need to triangulate. You need to look at, have, be curious with partners, be curious with the sales team. And then I think the third leg of the stool is understanding what your corporate goals are from your CEO, from the executive team above you, and kind of looking and saying, how do I mend all of these three together? And how do I give a win for everyone? And if you can do that, that's when magic happens. Because then yeah. you have three satisfied constituents and you're not just fighting for your team. Because there's some great channel leaders out there who say, I fight for my team every day. Well, you're only listening to one leg of the stool. Yep. Right. And so those folks like usually aren't as successful. Yep. Or, I like or that the a folks lot. that say, I just let's do whatever my CEO says. Well, then you don't have any of the following in the field because you're not driving it and aligning with them. So it's, it's an elegant dance that needs to happen. And it, you know, over the years, I've learned a lot on how to improve here. And sometimes I don't want to say it just comes naturally. You got to kind of force yourself to kind of really engage and make it a priority in your calendar. Yeah, you know, let's these, talk these about meetings. some of those learnings. That's interesting. The priority idea of it is really unique, obviously. And that, like, I think a lot of folks, leaders I've talked to of you know large ecosystems typically come and say, well, I meet with a partner once a month or every two weeks or whatever their cadence is. You're talking about three different groups in, in many yeah. ways. And each of those have an overlap. And there's this interconnectivity you described. Yeah. How much of this then is just programmed? Like you, three times a month, you meet, you know, once with each part of the stool versus yeah. organic. So I probably for the last six years color coded my calendar. Yep. So, I love that. I love a good color coded calendar. I'm obsessed with the same for its worth. <laughs> it, it, you gotta it, do it. So maybe, it's little, maybe it's my issue, but I do. No, so it's good. It's green. It means it's partner patient. 
If it's yellow, it means I'm interviewing someone or networking someone or listening. And if it's red, it means I have an internal meeting. And if my calendar has more red than yellow or green, something's wrong. And I truly pull back and I'm like, all right, what can I change? Because I'm, I've got to change that. So I always consider myself a, a forward looking or front facing leader, a field facing leader. And it's important to spend those times. So that yellow block is as important as the green, even though it may be interviewing or networking and listening. And I'm not dealing with a partner directly. Man, those are the, the skills that you get and really you learn a lot from those dialogues. I think we oversimplify it sometimes and we say it's it is just about the color code. I'm a, I I'm not joking. I color code my calendar I have for the last 10 plus years of my career. Yeah. And to your point, it's because of exactly the experience of looking at my week and saying, do I have enough of each of these different buckets? Is it right. full enough? Right. How do you then look back and take all of this over the course of, let's say, a quarter and build it into your QBR? And then certainly, how do you roll that up to your yearly goals across the entire business? Yeah. So a little uh, pro tip on QBRs. Please. Don't wait to do the QBR a week before the QBR. So I have a spreadsheet right now open up on my laptop that has a lot of the relevant questions that usually we want to share or be asked in the QBR. It's open every day of the quarter. So if I'm doing something, I have a conversation, I'm like, ooh, that's really good. I can remember that in the QBR. I'll add it in. So by the time someone says, hey, it's time to pull together a QBR presentation, I'm not sitting here scratching my head saying, God, all right, what were the important things? What did we do well? Where could we improve? What's my SWOT analysis? It's all documented there for the most part. And it, and it really helps you. So it it's a way to, I think a lot of us that naturally procrastinate, it forces you not to procrastinate. Now that I know it's always up, there's a great win or something I want to share or something that's just ugly, maybe... I need to improve on or the team needs to improve on, I'll document it right there. So it's a really way to make sure that, you know, it's clean communication that's very relevant and it's a not, not a last minute scramble. Yeah. I don't know about you, Barrett, but I think if you've seen reports or things that have done at the last second, you can always pick up on it. hundred percent. Yep. No, and it's more organic that way. I mean, if you're already having these conversations, that's why I was curious to hear whether you were using a tool, a framework or whatever, yeah. but it, it's as simple as saying, I'm already doing this work. Let me capture it ongoing. And then, yeah, I mean, I, I've been through many a, a presentation myself where you'd sit down at the end and someone would say, good, we've got four days. Let's go back and look at the last three months. So right. you've already done the work over the course of three months. Just do it right, as you right. go. Document we all want too yeah. hard to actually think about what did I do the last three months? Yeah, ago? of course. <laughs> of course. Or they love, I, my favorite moments were the ones where we look at the report and so it was a trend analysis and what happened here and everyone just kind of shrugs and goes, well, I don't know, that was 17 days ago and it was a yeah. Tuesday or whatever. Yeah. So that's really smart. Very true. So, so you're taking all this insight, you're synthesizing it into this presentation, your QBR, and obviously you talked about alignment across corporate goals as well. So what I'm always interested in, in terms of thinking about the different, I, I like the, the stool analogy, I agree with that, kind of the three steps of the value triangle. How are you then taking, you know, in your experience, what matters to the business? So, you know, today at Zscaler, obviously you've been in a variety of, of different firms before that. How do you take what you've done and make sure it applies to all three because there's give get there, right? I can't imagine you just say, which I, for, for what it's worth, before I say this, I, I know a lot of partner programs in particular, the bigger ones tend to say, this is what matters to us. If yeah. you'd like to join the journey, like yeah. step up, right? But like right. a flex to us, right. how much do you expect flex of your team versus your executive group? And then obviously the partners themselves and that kind of three leg yeah. system you're talking about. I think it's going and understanding the value and driving the value. That's the biggest part of it. So what is the value to, you know, when you're, when you say your corporate goals, people say, oh, we want to drive growth, but mm -hmm. what's growth? It's really, what is the value of the growth that you're bringing to it, right? And how do you ensure that the growth that you're bringing is really going to be incremental and it then value to what your business goals are? And then from a partner standpoint, it's sitting down and understanding what's important to them. Another way of saying the value tree, right? So yep. what's really important to them and how do they drive their business? Even down to sometimes the details of, tell me how your sales teams get paid. Tell me how, if you have a good relationship, tell me how you get paid. Like, what's your compensation model? Because I hate to say it, but part of the value for all of us is compensation. So 100%. understanding what motivates them, the motivators and drivers. And then for your team, it's that you're leading. How do you lead them to success? And I'll give you a real world story. I just rolled out a comp plan that after I digested the comp plan, I said, I'm off. I don't have it yet. It's not where we need to be. We pulled them all back and I re- uh, launched an entire new comp plan and I didn't relaunch it via email. I didn't relaunch it through a, uh, um, you know, another leader sharing it or sales ops. I got on a call with 300 people and said, guess what? I think I screwed up. It's my first year going through it at this company that I have today. I, 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 I learned, 
I wanted to make the change. I want to be transparent and vulnerable that, you know, I'm still learning, but here's your new comp plan. And it went over with rave reviews, partially because we really appreciated you coming on, telling us the process, where your thoughts were and where you're coming to. So again, the value to the team and meeting their needs. So again, serving leader for all three constituencies, listening and being vulnerable. Growing. Yeah. And, and to your point, focusing on what matters, I, I think it's actually, I was smiling for those of you who can't see my face right now, but because it, it is logical, it's simple, it's straightforward. I listen to what people care about. I ask them the question of what does growth mean to them? Early, even in my career at HubSpot in years past, one of the first things that I learned was we help companies grow. And it used to drive me bananas when I listened to the, the folks next to me and say, we help you grow. And they would just continue the conversation. They never define what growth meant and talk yeah. about in detail yeah. how it matters to that person. So to your point, Carl, I think just listening a little bit better, being more aligned with what that individual, that group of people needs matters. And then the last piece, which is probably the most you know, introspective, the most valuable is this idea of reflecting on what is and is not working and being open about, we made a mistake or we didn't. And you know, you need to step up in that case. Interesting. Yeah. And that's what you get over years. So I'm at a stage sure. in my career right now in the roles that I'm taking. And one of the key indicators I look for in, in transitioning in, in same company or moving a company is having the support and having the opportunity to fail because I'm aggressive with my thought process. I'm always trying to do something disruptive in the market and that intellectually stimulates me. If I'm in a position where I feel like I can't make a move and fail at something, that's not a good, that's not a healthy environment to be in. You want to be in an environment where you have the support where you're like, I'm going to be aggressive. I'm going to try some things that are going to work great. I'm going to try some things that are going to fail, but I'll fail fast. I'll make the change. We'll learn from it. We'll pivot. And I think there are a lot of leaders out there that are afraid to move because they're afraid of failing because what's going to happen. I mean, the average person in my role has an 18 month tenure in this role. And then That's interesting. the company scratches their head and says, now we're going to try a new leader because someone else needs the channel's important. We don't know what it means. We're going to bring in someone new instead of really supporting them and, and letting and giving them the ability to kind of grow into the role. And that's, it's disappointing part of the, the role, but uh, you're just going to find that right, healthy environment. Yep. And build trust. Going back to the beginning of our conversation, right? You've got tenure to your point. You've got experience and background. I imagine that brings a little bit of weight but also it sounds like your humility and your ability from that position to go and say, I I did something it didn't work. I did something and it did work. And right. then point to that conclusion. That's really interesting. If um, if you had one core takeaway from this stage of your career, I mean, you've got obviously a little bit of uh, longevity to it in that sense as well. If there's one thing that you do consistently or that you've learned to avoid, for example, you could share with our audience, what would that be? I spend a lot of time talking to future leaders right now. And it's interesting I think there's a lot of training and enablement for individual contributors who want to be first-time managers. I think there's a lot of training and enablement for managers who are early in career. I think there's very little training for senior leaders who are at that like senior director level that go and go into vice president because that that is a very big leap. So I personally kind of put together, you know, a little mentorship program of my own and to kind of coach them along and go through that. And a lot of what it comes back to is... And I feel repetitive to what you asked for, but it is that listening aspect. No, sir. Listening, be humble, be open, and don't believe your answers are the right answers. Because sometimes it's natural because if you have the seniority you've been doing a long time, you kind of know what the blueprint looks like. Never believe your own, never have confidence in your ability, but don't just assume your blueprint's the right blueprint. So continue to listen, continue to grow, and, uh, and hopefully have fun doing it. This is a hard job because there's a lot of complexities to it. And there's no two days that are the same. And we travel hard, we run hard. And unless you really love it, you know, find another career path because you really need to be passionate and love your job to do well at it. So to get to the highest levels and the folks that I know, that I, that I uh, network with, we all have one commonality. We all love our jobs. Like we are all here because it's not about the money. It's about the passion, about changing and growing others. And I think that's the one thing that I would, I'd leave you with is have passion about what you do, listen, and really, you know, lean in. That's fantastic. What a great way to end this episode. Carl, this has been really great. I enjoyed our conversation. If folks want to reach out and get in touch, where do they find you on the internet? Find me on LinkedIn. Reach out, you know, and say, as I was thick to say, we're hiring, we're growing, we're always looking for top talent. So I love, love building my network. So thank you, Barry. I appreciate it. Brilliant. It's been my pleasure. Folks, as always, thank you for listening to another episode of Outcomes. I'm your host, Barrett King. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>